Good morning, I'm Sam, and I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Church. Welcome to Faith Church. And if you're new here with us, we'd encourage you to just type new in the comments, and we'd love to follow up with you. Also, we invite you to like, subscribe, or follow us on social media. And if you're looking to connect deeper into our church and potentially talk to a member of our team, you can text CONNECT508 to 97000. Today, we're continuing our series called Hope in the Dark. So let's get started. You know, pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in. Stand up and let the wind blow, because there's hope. Welcome back to our series, Hope in the Dark. This is part two of our series. Have you ever been to a complaint desk? You know, you've been standing there and you've not been really satisfied with the outcome of the complaint itself. It's almost as if there needs to be a complaint desk for the complaint desk. Um, I remember it was uh, the day after we got married so many, many years ago, and uh, we had gone on our honeymoon down to Bermuda, and the day just was uh, not a good opening day to our marriage. Everything seemed to go wrong. I fell off my moped, got cut up, um, and then, then the... the the quintessential thing that happened at the end of the day, we'd gone in swimming after a long day of many things just going wrong. Um, I had nice white bathing trunks on and we had gone in swimming uh, in the ocean and then we had uh, walked up the beach and uh, had decided we needed to sit down to kind of clean our feet off on a nice bright blue bench. And as soon as I sat down with my nice white bathing suit on this nice bright blue bench, I realized that it had just been painted and there was no wet paint sign. Um, so lo and behold, I was just a little bit more than irate at this point. And so I decided to go to the complaint desk and give that person, the woman at the desk, just a piece of my mind. And of course, she was just this lovely, dear, sweet woman who just had this smile, this eternal smile on her face. And I could see that I was just getting nowhere. Have you ever been in a spot where you've just, you just wanted to complain? You know, everything seemed to be going wrong and you just kind of wanted to just, you know, take it out on somebody. You are you're just wanted to complain. I, I, I'm sure you've been there. Um, the great story uh, came out of Syracuse years ago. Uh, uh, a man by the name of Arthur Bundridge uh, went to the bank with a note saying, I want $20,000, put it in this sack. He was robbing the bank. And uh, you know, the, the teller put money in the bag and he went out and, and realized it wasn't $20,000. Well, he was just a little bent out of shape of the fact that, that he got shortchanged in this bank robbery. So what did he do? You guessed it, he went back to the bank to complain to the cashier, of which he was promptly arrested. Uh, complaining, it seems to be what we do best. Uh, we're dealing with the book of Habakkuk, and you could almost look at Habakkuk the prophet as a complainer. Uh, he seems to be one of the grouchy old men of the Old Testament. He's a prophet of God lived about 2,600 years ago. We don't know a lot about Habakkuk other than the fact that he has this long dialogue, three chapters worth dialogue, a prayer between him and God. Oftentimes, the prophets were sent into the world to be the mouthpiece of God, to, to speak to the people on behalf of God. But we don't see any of that in Habakkuk. We see instead... Uh, Habakkuk confronting God in almost a, a feisty kind of way. 
He tells God like it is. And the first chapter is a series of complaints. The first complaint goes something like this. And kind of, uh, you know, do you care? You know, I'm living in Israel that is in the midst of this moral corruption, moral collapse. All society seems to be uh, just headed downward. The people of God are cold towards you and there is sin on the streets. And God, you're not doing anything about it. And Habakkuk is just, again, a little bit bent out of joint on this one. And then God comes to him and says, I am going to do something about it. I'm going to take care of Israel's sin. I'm going to judge it. And I'm going to do something surprising and amazing, Habakkuk, that you're probably not going to like. I'm going to send the dreaded Babylonians. The Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. Um, that ruthless, bloodthirsty people, your enemies, and I'm going to send them into Israel to judge Israel. And so you can only guess that this is not going to sit well with Habakkuk. And so his second complaint, the complaint we're going to look at today is, are you fair? You know, I, I've just asked whether or not do you care. And uh, now your answer to me seems to me like you're not being fair about this. Uh, you're sending a people into Israel who are worse off than we are, who are worse than us more evil than us. This doesn't seem fair. And that's where we pick up the text this morning in verse 12 of chapter one. It starts out by saying this, are you not? 96 times in the Old Testament, someone is saying, are you not? And it's usually not something kind. This is a rhetorical question, but it's more than, than just a question. Uh, it's not seeking information. In other words, this is a derogatory way to say, you're not living up to my expectations. Are you not? And again, Habakkuk is just a little feisty right now, but, you, but I want you to see that there's, there's something more to this. Can you hear the angst in his voice? There's an anguish in Habakkuk over what he is seeing taking place in his nation. And for what about he is to see as the Babylonians are going to come in and run roughshod over the Israelites and carry them off into captivity. And Habakkuk just can't stand what he's about to see. See, I don't think that he is so much a complainer as he is a lamenter. See, I think, I think there's a big difference between lamenting and complaining. See, when you complain about someone, you're usually not doing it to their face. You're complaining about someone to someone else. Oftentimes when you complain about God, you're not necessarily doing it at God or to God. You're just complaining about God. Lamenting is a prayer of despair. Lamenting is taking your grievances to the throne of God and saying, I don't get it. I am upset. Do you know that one third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament? And it's almost as if God welcomes that kind of prayer. He doesn't welcome grumbling, complaining like the Israelites did in Numbers. You remember when, when the Israelites were uh, hankering to get back to Egypt. They wanted so desperately to go back to the land of, of slavery, to go back to Egypt. God had led them out, but, but they want to go back. And as they were grumbling against God, suddenly they found the ground open up underneath their feet. <laughs> See, God doesn't like grumbling. But God certainly, most certainly approves of lamenting. When we come to him with our issues, the things that we're upset about. See, I think that this book, the book of Habakkuk, shows that there's margin for us. There's grace for us at the throne that God welcomes sinners like ourselves to come and say, I don't get it. And, and here's how the, this question starts out. This is kind of an affirmation of, of Habakkuk's belief system. This is a well-defined, well-thought-out creedal statement almost. 
And he, and he says this, he starts out by saying, are you not from everlasting? Um, literally, are you not from of old? Uh, th th this is a statement of God's eternality. Uh, Habakkuk is rock solid in his belief and in his faith that God is everlasting, that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that he forever will be, forever has been, and forever will be. He is the God of everlasting. And, and not only that, but you're not only from everlasting, oh Lord, my God, but here again, it, this is a statement of self-existence. The word here, Lord, is the word Yahweh in the Hebrew language, uh, which literally means I am that I am. It means I always have been, I am presently now, I always will be, and there's been no one who has produced me. In other words, I'm self-existent, self-sustaining. I am the God who's not dependent on anyone or anything. And this is, this is Israel's personal uh, description of God. Israel is recommended to pray to God, Yahweh, God. You're the everlasting God, O Lord, my God, my Holy One. God is holy. He's, he's eternal. He's self-existent. And he is uh, most obviously holy. If ever there was a term in the Bible that's uh, used so oftentimes it is this idea, this word of holiness, that God is separate from. He is, uh, he, is not, uh, he is not like us in any way. He's not part of us. He is separate from us. He is holy. He is unique. It goes on to say this, we shall not die. This is kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Again, it's part of Habakkuk's uh, affirmation of who God is. This is just an affirmation of saying that uh, you've made promises to us, O God. You made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our, our patriarchs, that we, the nation of Israel, would not go away, that we would not die. You're the faithful God. You're the God of, of promises. You're a promise-keeping kind of God. And again, what he's seeing here is that some of these beliefs are being challenged now by what he is seeing. What's next? O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. In other words, what he's saying here is, you, the all-powerful God, are using the Babylonians to somehow bring judgment, reproof, reproof discipline upon the Israelite nation. See, this is what's up. <laughs> His creeds don't match up with the deeds. His creed about God doesn't match the deeds of God. What he believes about God is being challenged by what he is seeing taking place and what he is seeing of what is to come. Have you ever been in a place where you just don't understand what God's doing, why he's doing such and such, and it challenges your belief system? Does he care? Is he fair? Is he there? And, and that's exactly where Habakkuk's at. You know what's always a, a good thing that I think some of us, I think some of us really need to do every once in a while. We need to make a list. We need to, need to make a list of our losses. Those areas of our lives that uh, maybe we're frustrated about. You know, maybe some of you grew up with uh, parents that weren't the greatest parents. And, and you might question, why, God, did you allow that? You know, maybe you grew up with a critical father or a critical mother. I had a critical father in my life. Write it down. Maybe there was abuse in your life. Maybe there was sexual abuse in your life. Maybe you were raped as a child. Maybe you've got some infirmity, some medical issue that, uh, that has happened in your life. I invite you challenge you, make a list of your losses. Because you see, you can only begin to process them in a correct way as if you really know what you're grieving. You can't know how to grieve unless you know what to grieve. And it's good for us every once in a while to actually write it down on paper. Where am I frustrated? 
What frustrates me about God? Here's this God that I know, this God that I believe in, this God that I have this kind of creedal system about, and yet this is what I see. Here's my list. We're going to tell you what to do with it in a moment. So this is what Habakkuk believes, that God is everlasting, self-existent, holy, faithful, all-powerful. Hey, that's a pretty good belief system. He's believing all the right things. But here's his problem. Next verse. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Here's what I know. Here's what I believe. Here's what I see. You're not supposed to be able to tolerate evil. It, it shouldn't exist in your presence. How on earth can a good God use evil in the service of good? It just, his, he cannot wrap his mind around it. Doesn't, doesn't God do that? Aren't there so many times in the Bible when our good God uses evil in the service of good. Is the cross itself not something that God used, an evil thing that God used in the service of our good? Isn't that what God does best? In the next few verses, um, Habakkuk just keeps on talking about this, this Babylonian army that's going to come in. And they're going to come in and he likens them to fishermen who are just scooping with their nets the helpless fish. And, and he likens the Israelites and all the other nations that the Babylonians are scooping up to the helpless fish. And it says that the Babylonians are rejoicing over it all. And the word rejoicing is one that the psalmist uses over and over again for rejoicing um, over the Lord in worship. It's as if the Babylonians are just giddy about the fact that they can do this to everybody else around them, that they can, they can be this violent and this abusive to the other nations. Again, Habakkuk's head is just spinning right now. This just doesn't make sense. But here's what we see him do. After he has leveled his complaint, after he has said his peace, after he has lamented before God, after he has prayed this prayer of despair, of great anguish and angst, what does Habakkuk now do? Chapter 2, verse 1, I'll stand at my watch. I'll station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. He doesn't leave. He doesn't walk away from God. He goes up to the watchtower. Do you, do you know the, uh, the prophets of old were called watchmen? Um, a watchman back in the day was somebody who stood on the city wall and their one job, well, it was twofold really, watch and warn. Watch and warn. And in fact, this word watch is used way back in Genesis chapter 2 where God commands Adam and Eve to watch over, guard over the garden of God, as it were. Watch so that you might take care of it. And the, and the watchman upon the wall, the city wall, his job was to watch the horizon, to, to see if there be enemies coming. And, and, and if there was, to sound the alarm so that the city could mobilize against the enemy. Woe to that watchman who fell asleep. It, it was truly uh, a matter of life and death for the city. And his life would be taken if he fell asleep. And, and Habakkuk sees himself as that watchman. I'm going to go up to my, my station. I'm not abandoning my post. 
I am going up and I am going to wait on God. I'm going to continue to watch. I'm going to continue to wait. I am not going anywhere. See, so oftentimes in our day and age, the modern person kind of has this um, assumption, um, uh, this pattern of the way they think in regard to the sufferings and the pain of the world. See if this doesn't kind of resonate with maybe some of you. It kind of starts this way. Uh, Number one, a truly good God would not want evil to exist. A truly powerful God would not allow evil to exist, right? That's my creed. That's my belief. That's what I have faith in God about. But here's the problem. Evil does exist. So what am I to do with it? Well, the modern person, the modern mind just kind of concludes then, therefore, God, a good and all-powerful God, must not exist. That's where they go. So quickly, so, so, um, so blatantly, they just run from God. But, that, but Habakkuk doesn't do that. Here's kind of maybe the point that you and I need to think through on this. Is the existence of evil, does that necessarily then mean that a good and all-powerful God can't exist? Or could there be a reason? Could there absolutely be a reason that God has for evil and for the plans that he has for your life, for the lives of the people around you, for the life of this nation that we just can't understand? Some of you have children, right? Do your children always understand everything that you're doing for them, everything you're commanding for them? (laughs) To, (laughs) To believe that God must make sense to you is kind of an audacious thing to say. It doesn't make sense that you think God should make sense to you. He's not obligated to make sense to you. God is God. And you're not. Let me, let me put this on a more practical level. Just a couple days ago, my, uh, my poor sweet little Tibetan terrier by the name of Max had surgery. And uh, the poor guy, he, he had warts. He's got, he's just, he's a young dog, but he seems to get these warts all over him. And so we had to take him to the vet and he had to go under the knife. And, and she counted no less than 50 warts that were all over his body that needed to be removed. They they just keep getting infected. I mean, these warts had warts. I mean, she could only deal with about 10 of them. Our poor little Tibetan terrier, Max, could not understand. You know, as he came out of the anesthetic, there there was no understanding in his mind why he hurt so bad. I mean, this poor guy, he was whimpering all day yesterday. I went home for lunch today to check on him again. He was whimpering at lunch at lunchtime as well. And he has no clue, no clue whatsoever. You know what's so odd about this week? Not only is Max going under the knife, but, yeah, you guessed it, I'm going under the knife too for a lump on the back of my neck. Um, I, I have no idea why these things uh, go, go together. I, I you know... Now, I understand why my lump needs to be removed. Uh, you know, it's kind of getting in the way. My, my family calls it uh, dad's fatty bulge. <laughs> fatty bulge, it's got to go. <laughs> See, I get it. I understand. It needs to be removed. It needs to be checked on, thoroughly checked on, make sure it's not cancerous. I get it. My little Tibetan terrier doesn't get it. We are so much more like my Tibetan terrier. I love what Alvin Plantica says. He said, if I walk into my pump tent and I do not see a St. Bernard there, I would conclude there is no St. Bernard in my pup tent. If, however, I go into my pup tent and see no noceums, you know those noceums, those little flies, and see no noceums, I cannot therefore conclude that there are no noceums in my pup tent because I can't see them. And he said, the existence of suffering, the existence of evil, the existence of bad things in the world is so much more like the Noceums than the St. Bernard. We want suffering to make sense, but it doesn't. But Habakkuk shows us the way. He shows a, a faithfulness, 
of waiting on the Lord. Can I just kind of put it to you this way? That your success in pain is, is going to be because you're still in prayer. Your, your success in pain is in your stillness in prayer, through your stillness in prayer. Um, Martin Luther, the great reformer, put it this way, that prayer is a continuous, a continuous, violent action of the spirit as it is lifted to God. Can I just say that again? Prayer is a violent, continuous action of the spirit as it is lifted to God in prayer. Have you ever thought of prayer as something violent? I guess I venture to say Habakkuk did. That's Habakkuk's prayer. It's a, it's a violent prayer. And he is clinging to God for all it's worth. Uh, D.L. Moody put it this way, that he who kneels most stands best. How do you get through your hard days? How do you get through your suffering? It's to not throw belief in God out the window, but instead cling to him, cry out to him, communicate to him, lament to him, pray to him. Maybe some of you grew up in a home like I did, where um, you had two parents in the home and they didn't talk much, period, but they especially didn't talk about their conflict too much. I never heard my parents arguing because whenever it came to something they disagreed about, guess what dad would do? He'd go out and mow the lawn or he'd go down into the cellar and, you know, build something down, you know, on his bench or whatever. He just didn't talk. Well, if ever there was something wrong and, and there was disagreement, he would just exit. Some of you do that with God. That is a, the exact thing you do with the, the God in heaven who so desperately, desperately, desperately wants to talk to you, for you to commune with him and communicate with him. Intimacy grows in communication with him. It is through struggling in prayer. That's how best we grow. Your faith, your trust in God is developed in your crying out to him. Your, your description, describing to him what is aggravating. What do you do with that list? What do you do with that, that list that you've made for yourself of all the frustrating, frustrating, frustrating things in your life? Maybe you begin to turn these things over to God in prayer and you begin maybe perchance just to see the fact that God has used the evil in your life in the service of something good, of something so much better. I grew up with a critical father. <laughs> Guess what? When I was 15 years old, I got introduced to a loving, heavenly father who I found out cared about me, loved me, wasn't critical of me, thought the world of me. And that by itself, so much so that he would send his son Jesus. And that captivated my heart like nothing else. And so that deep, dark, evil thing in my life, having a father in my life who I could never do anything good for, now got turned around by realizing that there's a heavenly father who did think the world of me, who did care about me. It was the very thing that brought me to salvation in Christ. Do you see that maybe, just maybe, some of the evils that have gone on in your life are for some good. You may not know it yet, and you may not be able to figure it out yet, and that's okay. Remember, God is God, and you're not. But con continue to cling to him. Hold on to God through this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this marvelous book, the book of Habakkuk, and what this prophet of God has taught us about prayer. Lord, we have to be honest with you in our prayers. We have to bring to you all the, 
the anguish, the turmoil, the, the suffering that we have gone through, the, the suffering that our planet is undergoing. Father, we look at those who are around the world right now suffering. We're thinking of those who are on the West Coast dealing with some very grievous situations there. For those on our South Coast, for those in Florida and Alabama dealing with the, uh, the remnants of the hurricane. And Father, all across our nation and all around the world, people, people are suffering. And God, we are praying that in the midst of it all, you would use it for your honor and glory, that you will bring about a great awakening to the truth of who Jesus is. For we know that Jesus came into this world to save sinners such as ourselves. That God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That God, you so much loved the world that you gave your one and only begotten son. And that whosoever should believe on him, trust in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. God, we pray that you'll awaken us to the truth of who you are. We thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Hey there, my name is Corinne. I am 29 years old, and I am a single mother of two beautiful children. And I had my abortion when I was 22 years old. Um... Yeah, where do I begin? When I was 22 years old, I was just starting my career off in radio, and when you are a broadcaster, normally when you first start out, you have to move around. So when I found out I was pregnant with a guy I had only been dating for about six months, I felt numb. I felt this sense of guilt, and I felt like I was going to be rejected by not only my family, but my friends and my boyfriend's family. I was going to lose my career that I just started to have a baby. Maybe I could have the baby and I could get my career going and be a mom. There were people around me that didn't agree. And I could blame a million different people, but the only person I can blame is myself for my abortion. Honestly, I felt so lost. I didn't know where to go, what to do. I just felt like it, this was my only option. It wasn't really until I moved to Tennessee where this shame and guilt came back. And I'd gone through therapy. I had seen three or four different therapists. So none of the therapy really worked, to be honest. Um, they gave me medication and things like that, but I still felt like this deep regret from my abortion and nothing really solved that. Years passed and I, I've been looking up these pro-life uh, articles in different organizations after I saw the movie Unplanned. And I realized that I wasn't the only woman in the world to have gone through what I went through. So I was like, I want to help women. But before I can do that, I need myself to find some clarity. And thankfully I found Clearway. The best part about Clearway was not only getting this warm sense of like love and family and understanding and forgiveness, but I also found it in God. I feel like that's what separates Clearway from therapy going through the Bible, going through scripture, seeing what Jesus has to say, what Jesus can do if you follow him and his word. He is full of forgiveness, full of help, full of healing. Not only is it amazing to know that, but, but also the women at Clearway were like my guardians. They texted us they would make sure that we were okay that if we were feeling any anything to let it out heal and honestly I had to look at my abortion for what it was and I had to look at it straight in the face and admit not only that I was wrong but that I can be hopeful and I can succeed and I can find healing and I did and I just want that for everyone else I want women to feel loved and to know that you don't have to have an abortion to succeed, but you also don't have to suffer if you did have an abortion. We are in this together. What an amazing story of what God has done in Corinne's life through Clearway Clinic. 
We are grateful for organizations in the community that are making a difference, and our church is a proud financial supporter of Clearway Clinic. To find out more about who they are and what they do, you can visit their website, www.clearwayclinic.com. We could not support organizations like this if it were not for our faithful financial supporters here. So right now is an opportunity for us to give back to God. If you've been faithful in giving to our general fund, we would encourage you to continue to do so. But here at Faith, we want to go above and beyond to show our support to Clearway Clinic. So today, we're trying something new. It's called the Dollar Mission Fund. Each month, we will ask 100% of you to give $1 to this fund, and we'll give 100% of it away to the partner of the month. Some of you can give more, but all of us can give $1. And every single dollar we give to this fund today will go to Clearway Clinic. To do that, text CLEARWAY1 to 84321 and click the link, text it back to you. Again, just text CLEARWAY1 to 84321. We want to go above and beyond in our support for local partners like Clearway Clinic. So thank you for helping us make this happen. Right now, we're going to worship God through singing, so I'll turn it over to the band.
Yes, Jesus, we thank you. We sing to you this morning, Lord, as we worship you. God, we just take everything that we've been hiding from you, we lay it down before you right here in this moment. We're done with the hiding. Lord, our hearts need, need surgeons. So here we are, Lord. Let's sing this together. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. And I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again. Your son for redemption, the price from my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend all.
Amen, Lord. Jesus, we run to you today. We thank you that we can come into your presence with singing, that we can enter your gates with praise, Lord. And we come to you today, as we learned in the sermon today, that, that, that we are to, to run to you, that we are to embrace you in the middle of the storms, Lord, that our success, our getting through this, this storm that we find ourselves in today, Lord, comes from surrendering to you. So God, today we surrender. We surrender our, our doubts to you, Lord. We surrender our questions to you, Lord. We surrender our sin to you today, God. We, we surrender this storm to you and this trying to do it on our own, Lord. And we are here right now in this moment, Lord. We ask that you would fill us with your presence as we move forward from here and, and embark on a new week together as a community, Lord, as a church. God, that we would be people filled with your presence, people that don't run away from you, but run to you in the middle of a storm. Jesus, we are here today, and we thank you for meeting us right here in this moment. We pray all this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you're looking to connect deeper into our church and potentially talk to a member of our team, you can text CONNECT508 to 97000. Also, if this message has impacted you and you want to help others, you can give by texting any amount to the number 84321. Next week, we're going to continue this series called Hope in the Dark with Part 3. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week.